Yes, of course. Of course. We are ready. Are you ready? Yes, I think so. Are we ready? Yes. All right. <laughs> We're ready. Uh, hello and uh, welcome at Depot. My name is Jona Moro. And uh, on behalf of Depot, I would like to welcome you. Uh, it's great that you're here today. Um, before I hand over to our great panel today, I just want to make one short remark. Um, we are also sending this via live stream, so if you don't want to be heard in the discussion afterwards, so if you have a question and you want uh, that your voice is not heard in the live stream, then please just refuse to take the microphone I'm going to offer you. Um, and yes, you, you will not be seen anyway, so it's just about the audio. Uh, yes, so I will hand over to, to our podium and have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, good evening and thank you very, very, so much to Depot to host us. Uh, and uh, today uh, we decided uh, to present the book that you have here the cover, but uh, afterwards, uh, if it's an interest, or maybe we can even pass uh, one book around, no? If you want to go through while we are talking. Uh, so, um, the, this book, it's actually a very specific book, uh, because uh, it's a book uh, uh, that uh, uh, presents a, a focus on methodology and uh, uh, what kind of methodology or uh, what kind of content is inside is connected uh, with the results of the research uh, project uh, we applied. So who is this we? Uh, it's uh, Sofie Uitz, uh, Marina Grzinic, and the third uh, member of our research team, Jovita Pristoshek, so the names are here. Uh, we applied uh, for uh, the possibility to uh, be accepted to make a research project uh, that is connected with something new uh, that is offered by the European Union and it's called citizen science. And to put the things maybe very clear and uh, in, uh, like in, uh, in focus, uh, the idea of this uh, project, uh, citizen science, is a certain uh, thinking that uh, uh, science uh, today, uh, at least from uh, the perception of uh, um, the, the also European Union, but in general, is taking a very elitist uh, or a detached uh, position in society and that uh, the majority of uh, uh, those who are part of the civil society is not actually aware what's going on in uh, this uh, realm, or even better, it's not uh, uh, so much about this general view, but is uh, what we do, this is the, the main question that uh, uh, this uh, citizen science is, is a f uh, financial pot from the European Union is actually asking, is what you do with pupils. What, we, what you do with young uh, students, uh, those who are not studying, those maybe who are not yet 18, but still uh, because of uh, this generational change, they are uh, in power. Uh, they uh, are those who will go to the uh, polls uh, very soon. Uh, they also are part uh, of the institution of education. And uh, uh, the question was uh, if they are aware what, for example, science is actually bringing. And uh, when we applied for uh, the project uh, and uh, we uh, uh, thought mostly of the project that uh, were uh, proposed and also taken and founded, they are connected with uh, um, kind of uh, more uh, uh, natural sciences. That means uh, they are connected with uh, activities uh, that are uh, in nature, uh, they are very simple in a certain way, like um, 
uh, recollecting uh, the, um, for example, following for a certain period what's going on in the forest uh, or how, uh, what is uh, going on on a certain climatic question, but very uh, quantitative. Our uh, proposal came out from uh, two other researches that we already did, uh, us as a team and many others, we already did in the past. And uh, that means we apply to the uh, um, four uh, funds in uh, 2018 uh, to talk about uh, what we at that point uh, thought is really important. And this is uh, certain amnesiac uh, processes. So the process of forgetting uh, things that are uh, um, uh, evolving frictions in society. And we uh, made uh, these uh, relations to three uh, processes. Uh, one, uh, uh, it's uh, actually a deep uh, colonial past that is connected with the capitalism, uh, the Occident. Uh, then uh, the second point for us was uh, uh, that was a genocidal politics. And then what happened in the Second World War, uh, the uh, uh, Holocaust and uh, the aftermaths, and co also parallel to the Holocaust, antisemitism. So how you talk about antisemitism. So this was 2018. And the third point uh, that was uh, palpable in Europe was actually uh, the Balkan territory. And there was the Srebrenica genocide. Uh, so we uh, uh, clarified that that was a turbo capitalist process. So this, um, let's say, social science uh, humanity project, with which we started in 2018, uh, when it finished, we uh, proposed another project coming from that. And our main question always, always until the book, and in the book uh, was, and in the research and uh, the project and methodology was actually what is going today in societies, which groups are uh, pushed apart, they are uh, practically marginalized, they don't have a voice, or if they have a voice, uh, there exists a history of silencing these voices, as in this genealogy of amnesia. So the our next project is still going on, and it's called, um, uh, and it's actually connected with conviviality as potentiality. It's a very utopian because conviviality means living ne one with other, near other, not uh, uh, taking somebody and subsume, but actually really having a relation and having an, uh, 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 also a communication and a possibility to share uh, different uh, uh, backgrounds and making a common ground. So this conviviality as potentiality was key and actually came out also in the time when it was the pandemic because the pandemic was a, a moment of big distance. Practically, we lost the idea of society. It was all these seclusions and so on. So when uh, there was uh, the possibility to apply for this project of citizen science, we decided to go again into this uh, uh, way. And we proposed uh, the idea uh, to think about uh, citizenship and that, of course, include non-citizenship, because when you talk about citizenship, you always have the other side, no? Like amnesia, if you forget, you, uh, you remember something, you ask yourself what is actually lost in that process and why it's lost. So our title, as you uh, can uh, see uh, on the book, uh, is uh, a Civil Society Reimagined. Uh, and uh, practically uh, uh, the idea is uh, to think about citizens' memories and imaginaries and what we term democratic citizenship. And this democratic citizenship means that practically everybody who lives in a community and to work or come to a certain community uh, uh, would have uh, a possibility to be part also on the formal basis, but also informal. That means has a visibility, uh, has a place in the society. So uh, this uh, idea 
uh, then we transmitted back to the schools and uh, Sophie will explain how this, uh, we had to invent a methodology because uh, our main uh, target was, as it was already in genealogy of amnesia, our main target uh, was uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, work with three types of communities, especially in the Austrian context. And these three types of communities uh, are uh, three uh, lines that differ, I will say, from uh, a fixed uh, normative uh, uh, idea of the dominant uh, nation. Uh, and this is, of course, migrants. Migrants are always uh, uh, put uh, in a friction situation. They are always uh, put under question, or they are integrated, or they are actually pushed outside with through different namings. Then the queer community, because the queer community opened uh, absolutely, uh, as the migrants, a new possibility. Uh, opens new visions uh, in what was one line uh, of uh, 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 this uh, heteronormative way of life. And of course, uh, for Austria, looking historically, uh, one of the most uh, uh, central community is the Jewish community. Uh, and uh, these three lines, these three communities were uh, put uh, as a f uh, focus in our research with these pupils in the schools, and we started to think uh, how uh, we develop uh, actually our methodology, uh, how we uh, enter uh, this uh, idea uh, to work with pupils, with schools, uh, and uh, the outcome of these relations, of this uh, almost uh, uh, making with working models, how to approach, because it's another way of talking, it's another way of uh, presenting the topics, also to open the dialogue, and also an important point uh, was uh, that uh, still you have to come out uh, with a sequence of uh, uh, outcomes, like visuals are very important, but then uh, one of the very important moment was that you cannot uh, actually record uh, uh, in uh, with a photography. You cannot uh, make a video because you uh, actually destroy the possibility of uh, uh, exchange. Simply, uh, nobody will talk and uh, come to an idea of uh, asking or uh, commenting if a camera of any kind of uh, uh, this uh, technological visual device will be put in front. And it's very threatening, especially in, in the process. So uh, this made us actually also uh, inventing and uh, trying to solve like the whole process of the methodology in what we call labs. It was three labs uh, with three schools, uh, also whom to invite to talk, uh, uh, how to share this uh, uh, interplay uh, with the, uh, uh, what kind of uh, space to open. Of course, it was art and culture, because also we proposed this project from the Academy of Fine Arts, and there is artists on every corner, and they actually really have a language, and they have a strategy, and in culture, many things to art and culture can be, be, uh, be part of the discussion. And especially, uh, we could uh, uh, to work uh, with uh, um, uh, like a part of the team uh, with uh, 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 artists who draw, uh, and they could make drawings uh, regarding what we were doing. So our processes were actually getting like some kind of a photo roman or a roto roman, if you want. That was fantastic. And Felix Deiters, it's uh, we, uh, with us uh, today uh, that actually did this big work. Also with the students and pupils uh, that were part of the classes and being part uh, of our methodology. And maybe before I just uh, uh, pass uh, the word to Sophie and then we go with our guests, I want to say hello to Asimina Guma uh, that will be presented before 
uh, we start really to talk, and Asimina Guma was one of these important uh, positions, uh, working in these labs and also contributing with the text. I will come back to the structure of the book. And uh, uh, thinking that this project uh, is a project about also Europe, more like uh, it's about the global world because we live in a global capitalist world. Uh, we were very happy uh, that uh, Claudia Tatzreiter uh, could uh, uh, join us uh, uh, and uh, coming from Sweden and uh, working and being a specialist in uh, migrational politics uh, that we will also talk. We said maybe it's uh, very good to also see what uh, this project uh, uh, it's uh, how it can serve maybe as a model uh, for a cer certain uh, European space. So this will be uh, the first part, uh, and after I will come back to the uh, book and maybe say some few words more about uh, uh, who this European project, who is taking part, which states, and uh, yeah, how this consortium also uh, functioning. Okay, I will um, take over here. Thank you all for coming and for watching and for being on the podium with us here. Um, thank you, Marina, for introducing the research project and the book. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the practical part of our research because this is ultimately what um, we tried to document in this book, um, something that is rarely done, um, rarely done in general, to combine citizen science with artistic research, and even rarer that um, this process is documented. And the idea was really to share this. We purposefully published it with a publishing house that is very strong in the pedagogical field, um, corporate from Munich, um, because we, we do think that the methodology that we devised for this project worked quite well and has a lot of potential. So what we did, as Marina already mentioned, is that we held three memory labs. One lab lasted one day, and we collaborated with three high schools from Vienna and from the surroundings, one class from each high school. Um, we're very thankful that these schools worked with us, because without them we couldn't have realized our research. It was the Borg Guntramsdorf, the HLW Biedermannsdorf, and the BRG 6 Marketigasse. And these three different schools had one class coming from each of them. And these classes, 15 to 20 students each, age 17 to 20, also reflected the diversity that is common in Vienna and in the surroundings. Um, and so they brought, the students of course brought their own experiences, their own approaches, their own knowledge, histories, memories, and imaginaries about um, uh, minorities and marginalized groups um, about discrimination, racism, and all these lines of frictions. And we invited to these labs also three partner organizations that we cooperated with throughout the research project and with whom we tried to reflect the, the, the more closer focus that we wanted to shed on memories and imaginaries of Jewish, migrant, and queer communities in the Austrian context. And these uh, three organizations were the Documentation Center for Austrian, of Austrian Resistance, the DÖF, um, the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute uh, for Holocaust Studies, and the University of Education um, from Upper Austria. And each of these institutions, um, with each of them, we had one partner to collaborate with. Asimina Guma was back then um, at the University of Education in Upper Austria. We had Bernhard Weidinger from the DÜF working with us and Miriam Wilhelm from the Wiesenthal Institute. Um, and so these three people visited the labs as experts who brought inputs and who brought their own, yeah, like stimulations for discussion. And then we also invited artists, um, Ezra Oesman, a rap artist and a poetry slam artist and also um, a PhD student at the Academy of Fine Arts, also with a research background, and um, visual performance artist Ndidi Iro, who works with photography or worked with the students with photography. Um, and, um, and so these were the participants 
citizen science, uh, citizen scientists, or one could say citizen artists in the form of the students, um, and some interlocutors from these organizations. And um, at this point, I would also mention that the teachers of these three classes, uh, Lisa Hartmann, Margarita Schütz, and Katharina Lenera, were very important partners for us because they were the ones who um, engaged um, as partners with us and who brought the students, who convinced the students or motivated the students to take part. Um, the classes themselves were offered this by these teachers and they like, decided that they wanted to participate. So we, we did a little bit of a search in uh, the wider region of Vienna um, to find such classes and then in the end, um, thanks also to the engagement of these teachers, um, we found these uh, in total 55 students. So the 55 students came in three groups um, in May 2022 for one day each to the Academy of Fine Arts. And there we um, met them with a little breakfast to loosen the atmosphere. Um, they were quite excited to come to the Academy, like also to come from a school uh, setting to get out of a school setting into the Academy of Fine Arts. For many of them, it was the first time in a university setting. Um, was quite uh, uh, interesting as such. And then uh, Marina, Jovita, and I introduced the research project again to them. They had already received some information beforehand from via their students, like uh, uh, what we provided to them. Um, but we tr we we tried to frame that these labs for them in a way that it's not um, too academically abstract and threatening because the whole idea was that it's a, it's a day of discourse and also of sharing and listening and encountering each other where they are not just served some input but where they amongst each other start the discourse. And so we framed it um, with the fundamental question uh, of community political community, different types of communities, and a reflection on who is part of what community, who is denied uh, the membership of certain communities, and uh, what are the reasons uh, to be able to participate or not. And of course, citizenship is one such community, but in the end, um, uh, we, we and they discussed many other forms of community as well. Um, and also how art and culture can be really reused to um, as a, like, as, a, as a performative social tool to intervene. And the, the, lab, the labs were then uh, conducted in three sessions, one to two hours each, um, with a lunch break in between. And each of these sessions was introduced or led by either an artist or one of our guests from the institutions that we partnered with. And they used different methods. So we had a mix of methods. Um, uh, artistic practices, we had photography where um, photographs were taken or discussed, we had rap and poetry where lyrics were written and performed in front of the group spontaneously, um, and we had um, drawings um, that were conducted by the students themselves during the labs and also by our uh, invited um, artist Felix Deiters who was recording the whole event as Marina mentioned we decided against video and audio, we found this too invasive, and so we had a graphic recorder um, who was uh, drawing in the beginning, um, or like uh, throughout actually, like every few minutes a drawing basically, and we had a huge table in our atelier space where these drawings, as, they, as Felix finished them, uh, they put them down, and so this image stream grew through the day, and in the breaks, the students would go to this table and reflect on what was just said an hour ago um, by looking at these drawings, by finding also themselves maybe, and some quotes of what they said, and having another level of discussion, a more informal way of discussing certain things that were said. And the things that were said, as we heard in many different instances from the students, were for many of them new, even though they had been in a class for many years in some cases together. On these days, they talked about things that they had never shared before. So this was part of the f format, of course, that um, through different tools and also through these artistic approaches to open a space of discussion of sensitive topics and socially 
um, also conflictuous topics that would otherwise, uh, and especially with more classical research tools, maybe not be accessible. Uh, the students were also given drawing materials themselves. Many of them took this opportunity and spent the day just also doodling or drawing or just recording what they found important and added it to the stream of images that Felix produced. And so we had this beautiful um, documentation um, uh, of, uh, of uh, sketches. And yeah, the, the um, documentation was then also um, compiled after these three labs in a general assembly, which we held a few months later, um, to which the idea was to invite all of the students so that they can also meet each other. And um, we had a gallery of uh, a selection of these uh, drawings that were done so that the students could also see what other students from other classes discussed in, uh, in similar settings. And we gave them the opportunity to just also feedback and reflect again in the bigger group on what has been done. And I think in, in hindsight, the, like reflecting on this method, um, we came across a quote from Maxine Green from the 1990s where um, they say that the arts have the distinct power to open up our imagination toward the unimagined and the uncertain. And I think that this showed very well in these memory labs that through art, um, through this detour of sometimes taking a photograph as indeed Ichi Iro did, having them take a photograph and then discuss it later or uh, talk about photography, Asimina Guma will tell us more about that, talk about ph photography and use that also as a tool to in the end reflect about your own situation, um, uh, is opening up um, new territories that maybe classic qualitative research designs um, have difficulties to reach. And um, this potential to open a space of discourse also through artistic means is something that artistic research shares with citizen science. So in conclusion, um, we also find that citizen science or citizen art um, is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is, a very, is a very powerful match because the intention of artistic research is not to just uh, produce knowledge, um, but also to open a discourse with and about this knowledge. So it's not a one-way street. And I think that showed very well in these labs that they, the students did not come to hear lectures and learn something from academics and from artists, but um, they also just amongst uh, each other shared and listened and learned and relearned um, about the, the the inclusions and exclusions that they as a group, but also they as individuals who are part or not part of many other groups um, uh, have in common. And yeah, so with that, I'll give the word back to Marina, who okay. will tell us a bit more about the structure as such, and then we can hear from Asimina, who led one of these lab sessions and can tell us what her particular approach was. Yeah, and then also uh, by uh, Claudia Tatzreiter yes. about uh, uh, this uh, much uh, international context that it's, uh, yeah, how the schools and what's going on, for example, in Sweden, but also in Europe. But I wanted to, to say when, uh, before, when it was mentioned uh, photography, uh, it was really uh, uh, Didi Ayroch uh, uh, use uh, photography, being a photographer, uh, uh, to give uh, the very, this what is called throttle camera, no? A small uh, things that you can buy for a few bucks uh, in uh, um, some shops, and this was given to the students. So they could actually, in a certain way, they were asked uh, to reflect uh, about them. Uh, maybe uh, they always, they are in contact, but the question is if they really think uh, what that community is in the school, how they uh, connect each other and so on. And the book, uh, practically, we now almost discuss the first part. So the book is uh, given in few uh, parts. In the first part we uh, decided uh, with Jovita Bristoshek to enter these uh, questions of uh, um, uh, general questions, li like uh, we talk about methodology, also why to talk about democratic citizenship, no? Uh, because citizenship uh, more or less is never democratic. Uh, 
because it's uh, always uh, connected with the many power structures uh, and it's connected with the nation state. Uh, so cannot be democratic because it's actually filtering and it's putting apart or it's transforming many citizens, even in second and third grade citizens, though they uh, are uh, citizens, let's say, uh, uh, in a full uh, full meaning of this word, but in the second part, uh, we really uh, uh, already from the titles, uh, it's really possible to understand that though it was a place for dialogue, also uh, questions were posed that we in general talk. Uh, for example, uh, Bernard Weidinger. Um, uh, he started. Uh, to, he immediately entered the discussion. Uh, in that uh, day that we had uh, in many different slots, uh, and he asked the questions, who is us and who is them? No? How society actually, uh, uh, um, uh, you are part of the society, but you are actually marginalized. And uh, uh, he tried uh, through uh, also making like examples or cases, because it was really a question to invent to invent a model how you talk and how uh, those who are supposed to react will react. So he said, uh, he also write about mechanism of social inclusion and exclusion. And this was actually very present. Uh, it was present uh, looking uh, from uh, the afar. Uh, in that setting, how the, already the class as such, it's actually uh, absolutely differentiated. It's those who talk, those who never open the mouth, those who actually take very positions outside, and those who lead the, the, the line what will be said and also represent the space. Then, um, uh, uh, Asimina will talk more, but it's really uh, very telling the title because uh, the questions of friendship, we think if it's a class, a classroom, it's actually uh, a friendship. No, the friendships are actually more or less even uh, imagined. And sometimes they are imagined, but they are not going on as a friendship. Because already this differentiation are, and especially was very important when you were, and you will talk, uh, uh, when you were actually showing, uh, uh, posing the question, are all the schools the same? And then you discover actually that the schools are already very much question of power and differentiation, and that they are really uh, already uh, marginalizing certain pupils that they cannot enter that school. And uh, 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 from the Wiesenthal Institute today, uh, we uh, hoped, but unfortunately could not be uh, the case. Uh, we invited the Wiesenthal um, Institute because uh, it's uh, very open and uh, do a lot of work on the Holocaust studies. And uh, it was uh, an interesting uh, uh, case that was brought, Viera Bila, an artist who actually uh, 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 was a synthesis of, uh, of all the three cases, a lesbian, uh, a migrant, and Jewish. And it was very uh, uh, um, interesting to think uh, why she practically uh, was completely uh, 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 put outside of the, the society and had huge troubles. And uh, from um, uh, the, the, the presentation uh, that worked a lot with images, uh, tried to actually uh, present this and uh, tried to, to reflect. And then it was a lot of feedback because uh, though uh, it's a taboo topic, uh, some students uh, uh, tried to think uh, how this marginalization is w working in their setting. Or uh, a very important uh, artist was Ezra Rep or Ezra Osman. Ezra Rep is in any way one of the most uh, known rapper in, in Austria. And uh, the, she decided to uh, organize the space of uh, that time in which uh, uh, she uh, wanted to talk about migration, not, though she is not a migrant. Uh, she was born in Austria, but uh, it's a constantly the question of, uh, of being uh, uh, pushed back and forth 
because of the society that actually include and exclude in the same time. And uh, uh, her methodology was that uh, in that hour, practically she motivated so much these pupils that they started to rap. And they really rapped. They started to rap about uh, how they see their position. Uh, they even were, uh, we, uh, uh, she to, uh, brought the, uh, the beat, and they were actually uh, starting to uh, make, like with the music, uh, the rapping. rapping and uh, in uh, the book, uh, we uh, decided to uh, make an interview with Ezra in which she talks about the life and politics of migrant youth. Practically, she rethink her life in Vienna uh, uh, and all uh, the histories of impossibility in a certain way, and also how much uh, the artistic form of rap, but also rap as a, a, a protest, uh, uh, as uh, very much connected with the uh, text in terms of uh, uh, the, the text, uh, texts are very telling because they are um, making an analysis of society, how this helped her uh, to, uh, in a certain way, empower herself and come and also empowered through these other people. And uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Njideka, no, Njideka Didi, Ayroch, uh, she uh, being uh, uh, encapsulating queer and black community in one, uh, uh, she proposed a very telling title, Imagining in, in Full Color. That means really imagining the life or a possibility and also uh, 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 situating uh, uh, somebody from uh, these two different communities uh, really in full color and not black and white, as it's in many cases. So she's talking about mapping um, uh, the self-portrait, because when she was giving these cameras, uh, she also was thinking those who are taking a photo uh, and is putting uh, himself, herself, or themselves in front of the camera, practically, it's also uh, thinking about how it will be captured and what, how, how it will be uh, uh, made uh, for, uh, uh, in the photograph, like taken and uh, uh, visualized. Uh, and uh, as it was said, it was very interesting text by the teachers because we asked them to reflect after how, what was their, uh, uh, experience and also if they had a chance to talk um, with the students afterwards uh, and uh, for them uh, it was uh, really clearly that the discrimination is very present in school and uh, uh, also uh, that it will be necessary to strengthen the communities in the school though it seems that uh, uh, it's a long way to go. In the end, uh, as we now invited uh, Claudia Tatz writer, already in the book, uh, we wanted to have parallels because you are not insular. In a global world, you live with other uh, uh, countries and you live in a common space, uh, let's say the space of Europe. So uh, we invited uh, Sasha Kesic, uh, who, were, uh, who uh, was asked to write about the queer content in Serbian education. Why? Because uh, in Serbia, uh, specifically, and Sasha Kesic being an activist uh, from the uh, LGBT uh, queer uh, uh, I plus community uh, wanted actually to present how in that context it's really uh, almost uh, deadly uh, to be a queer person in the Serbian and also how this is connected with the whole process of education. How already in the education process practically this is put outside of the curricula. And we also invited uh, Araba Evelyn Johnston Arthur post festum and was very interesting because Araba Evelyn Johnston Arthur, Arthur uh, made uh, uh, a very, very telling title. Teachers don't want to teach what we want to be taught. So practically, uh, uh, her perception was that uh, pupils wa want something else 
than what the teachers is coming and telling them. And uh, uh, even more precisely, she said thoughts on mattering black critics of racism in the local Austrian classroom. And she practically being now a doctor and uh, having a university career, pull her back, so her history, and remember uh, really processes of uh, a very uh, strong racialization in the moment when she was actually going to school. And the most interesting point was that she was going in one of these schools the, from which we got the, one of the classes taking part. And she started to read and she said, but I was going in that school. And that school was really uh, difficult. This, so it was interesting also to have such a reflection, uh, uh, not intentionally, but actually came out very intentionally and very much on the point why and how to think back this history. So uh, with the uh, word, uh, the book is really some kind of a pioneering uh, uh, example, especially from, for the Austrian context where it's more natural sciences and less uh, uh, humanities and less uh, social sciences. And I said before that in EU this is a big topic it's really a big emphasis, and for now, uh, it's uh, 14 countries from the EU taking part, and many uh, different NGOs and gruppations throughout uh, uh, Europe. But uh, in general, uh, from our experience, uh, I can say for me, uh, it, uh, it was really an unbelievably important process, also for us to think because you uh, understand that many things are already decided uh, not in the university, but is uh, decided already in elementary and in the middle school, especially in the Austrian and German system of schooling. So when it's come, the critique is too late. It's already necessary to change much before the structures and to put uh, the attention. But we go immediately with Asimina and I think uh, you take with the presentation mm -hmm. of our speakers. Okay, um, Asimina Kuma is sitting right hand side of me. Um, I'll briefly introduce her. She's a professor at the Institute of Urban Diversity at the Education University, uh, University of Education in Vienna. Um, previously, when she worked, uh, when she collaborated with our project, she was at the Institute for Inclusive Education at the uh, University of Education in Upper Austria. So we're happy that she's now fully in Vienna. Um, and um, her research topics, or some of her research topics are migration, multilingualism, and intersectionality. And um, so Asimina has held um, two sessions in two different memory labs, so she's met two classes and um, wrote about it in the book. And my first question to you, Asimina, would be about your method methodology um, that you can maybe say a little bit about, um, how you approached your sessions, and whether that's something that you devised specifically for, this, for these memory labs, or if this is something you've had experience mm -hmm. with before. So thank you very much for the invitation. I uh, will ask you to just uh, pose a question if something is not clear during uh, I'm telling about my methods. Um, <clears throat> so it was a very exciting project for me. And um, as you said, um, I'm in a traditional way, we would say um, I'm not an ex uh, I didn't study something like arts, something such exciting, just boring sociology or communication <laughs> studies. And so when I, I had to find um, an idea and a methodology about um, unimagined friendships and how um, structural conditions shape our relationships, um, I used something that it's not very exciting in arts. I used class photos. So this is not uh, usually the, the object uh, um, uh, artists speak, like to speak about. Mm, class 
pictures, you know them, everybody has some of them. And um, actually it was uh, a, f a fascinating um, medium, I would say, um, for uh, what I wanted to discuss with the young people. So I had to, f um, so I made some research about class photos. Uh, theoretically, because um, I'm working uh, a lot about uh, critics on diversity, yeah, what about the diversity discourse, and I teach a lot about uh, this um, subject, and um, we have a very strong iconography of diversity. Hmm? So we have a lot of uh, pictures also in the media, where white people and then one black, black person is in the middle. So one uh, company then is diverse. Um, I'm sure you know, uh, you have seen such pictures uh, everywhere in the media. And class photos are similar. You know, if, um, so um, I could tell or discuss with the students, I could tell a story about this iconography of diversity because I also used historical photos. And um, at the beginning, nobody cared about diversity and its iconography. So we just have classes, let's say from the year 1930 uh, or even before where you could see there were only boys, um, there are uh, black, white um, um, photos. They have rather similar things uh, they are wearing. So it's a, a very uh, strong homogeneity, you can see. And um, we could discuss about gender, for example. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. How schools uh, as part of the society, uh, shaped uh, our friendships um, through um, selecting or making classes with only boys or only girls. Mm -hmm. So this this is the old story about mm -hmm. diversity and or homogeneity. And then we had um, a photo about. Um, uh, from uh, from the time of national uh, socialism, mm -hmm. and we could s we couldn't see the faces of the children, but it was we had a lot of knowledge about mm. what we were seeing. Mm. Yeah, so we had a lot of knowledge about again about unimagined friendships, like uh, we knew that a lot of social groups weren't inside mm. this classroom. Jewish students, but also um, left-wing families or Roma uh, children were not in this classroom, and so on, or um, children with disabilities. Mm. Yeah, so, and this, so like how a society, even if a picture looks quite diverse, yeah, because in this classroom there were boys and girls and they were wearing different things, for example, and so on. Um, how, when, if we have the knowledge about society, how much things we know then about the diversity in this classroom? And of course, uh, at the moment when I asked, so it was a bit strategical because in this age, um, the students in the uh, memory labs, uh, they're of course very interested in friendships. Yeah, it's a very strong uh, uh, motive for, for participation in the discussion. So we had class photos and we had uh, friendship as a context. So how school shapes my friendships and um, Actually, I, I, I'm still teaching with these yeah. <laughs> pictures, <laughs> yeah, because um, it's such a powerful um, medium. 
this, these photos, this diversity, the, the iconography of diversity mm -hmm. is such a powerful medium. Mm -hmm. And um, we have, but we know that it is a racist society. We know that the school um, is um, excluding or is selecting social groups. So if we have this knowledge, how can we just believe uh, just a photo who looks uh, um, colorful or diverse in a kind of mean? And this is something I, um, so the methodology I used there, I'm still working with it. And um, I, I'm very, um, they're always very fascinating discourses. So I find a class photo can be a fascinating way to discuss about diversity. Even the less, um, very few of us are happy with our class photos, I guess. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, but I think really it's a fascinating thing to talk about. And so in the session you, um, you then brought the discussion to the class that was present in the room and um, and you started and like or you were able to encourage a discussion about so their own class mm -hmm. classroom composition and you also introduced um, the layer of class class position mm -hmm. and reflected with the students about that and how like what would a um, what do you think about the results, so to say? Or like, what do you think about what the students had to, what, what came from the students, what reflections came from them? Did that surprise you, or did that fit also within your, your mm -hmm. research that you've done to that topic? Well, um, I, once uh, Rubia Zalgado said to me or to a discussion, um, everybody who teaches mostly wants to be loved by the students <laughs> yeah it's a relationship <laughs> and no. of course i also want to um yeah to have such a relationship mm -hmm. yeah to to be loved um with my um <laughs> positions i don't get a lot of it mostly <laughs> yeah it's a bit uh, difficult and um there was um as you as you saw it you you remind me of this there was um a lot of resistance to accept um, the positions I wanted to discuss mm -hmm. because um, it's um, who um, because the students there said uh, no uh, nobody shapes my friendships mm -hmm. it's my own decision mm -hmm. and. Um, because of their age, I also at the, um, by designing these sessions, I also had to ask myself how far can I go. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, um, I feel uh, more free with the students at the university, mm -hmm. you know, to push uh, the positions, mm -hmm. the discussions more, but with. Um, not even young adults. Yeah, how can how far can I go? Because to accept that structures shape our relationships, shape our friendships, um, it's it's very hard mm -hmm. for them to accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or um, actually, my focus um, at the university now is about parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, parents, for example, are a very, um, a, a very strong social force in the schools. You know, there is a lot of segregation in the schools. And I'm not speaking about some uh, right-wing parents who are going um, crazy. Actually, I sp I'm speaking about us. Yeah. So don't imagine any kind of crazy guys who just want to visit the private school or so on. So I speak about us. There is, I, I'm not sure if it's an international um, notion, Bobo parents, do you know? I don't think it's yeah. international. <laughs> I think it's kind of Austrian. It's about 
bourgeois, bohemian uh -huh. parents, yeah, mm -hmm. parents who are privileged, but mm. they don't like to put it in front, so they're kind like hippie or uh, they have a kind of mm. mentality how to present themselves. And um, so let's say there's a wonderful podcast <laughs> from the New York Times. It's called Nice White Parents. It's really wonderful to hear what happens. Mm. And are th these parents is uh, the ones I want to focus or I focus on how they try to control the friendships of the children, mm. how they uh, support segregation in school, inofficially also. Mm. There is official, mm. there is because of the private schools, there, hmm? but there are also inofficial ways to um, to prevent some friendships from your child. Yeah, so... Um, but this is going on, I think, uh, everywhere in, in general. Maybe they are not uh, the f from the same social classes, but they are f definitely um, uh, higher uh, middle class, uh, maybe uh, not even with this bourgeois provenience, yeah. but the same uh, things happen, f for example, also in other parts. Uh, yes. um, we talked about it also in the ge uh, genealogy of amnesia. Mm -hmm. So um, I had there the position that we all have a, collect, um, a historical memory of selection, mm -hmm. of exclusion. Mm -hmm. Our parents were part of exclusion processes in school. The school, the, histor the history of school is a history of exclusion and selection. And so we all ha have this memory, yeah? How can we select, how, how can we exclude um, children from uh, classes or from the friendship, from the networks mm -hmm. of my children? And um, there's a lot of work to resist to this knowledge, to say, no, no I'm, I'm going to stop this tradition. There's just work, it's just not, uh, you can make uh, photos of diverse classes, but um, as I, I wrote there, um, because of my students, I, I can uh, learn a lot about how schools inofficially mm. yeah, try to put social groups together. Mm. It's not an official strategy and how parents push in this direction. So we had a school, um, a, a class with um, kind of international image and um, a young black boy was in the middle of the class mm. photo. It was just like a, a message, we are diverse, mm. we are not racist, mm. nobody wants to be a racist. Yeah? And, but actually I know from my students who teach in this school that the unofficial uh, rule is that no parents without an academic um, background, uh, abschluss, a degree, yeah. mm -hmm. a degree, can bring their child there. Mm. Okay, mm. this is not written anywhere, but it's the rule. How the school, it's a private school, how they choose their uh, students. Mm. And then we speak about diverse and so on, and mm, with sometimes we, it's blurred, what do we mean with it? And then we have private schools with the uniforms. Mm. They want to say we're, uh, we're kind of diverse, but we have one thing in common, yeah? And this is mm. wealth, financial wealth, at, at least, mm. yeah? And so it's, um, these diversity discourses, I, I like a lot uh, the work of Sara Ahmed. This was very inspiring for me. Um, it's very hard uh, how it works. And it's, it, um, it needs a lot of work to resist to this story of diversity as a, uh, a place mm -hmm. of happiness, just or mm -hmm. everybody likes diversity or however. Yeah, there's a lot of pow power relations and um, yeah.
Thank you very much, Asimina. Um, go with. Uh, shall we? Yeah. Are, are there any questions at this point? Yes. Um, we can also. We also have questions in the end, of course. But so we go with uh, Claudia uh, and yeah, please. Yeah. Aha, super. Yeah, please. Could you please just uh, repeat the question maybe so that... Um, the question is who is Sarah Ahmed? Um, um, Sarah Ahmed is, uh, had, was a professor in, uh, I think she's from... Goldsmiths. She's, Goldsmith, she's but not Australia. anymore. But no. she's been in the UK for yeah. most of her working yeah. life. Yeah. And uh, she was teaching... Um, I th what was her focus? Uh, it was uh, uh, about uh, feminism and uh, uh, emotion, yes. uh, phenomenology. Yes. Yeah, she is, but she's yeah. great, yeah? yeah. And she yeah. wrote Absolutely. about yeah. how feminists killing yeah. joy, feminism and killing joy, and so on, that um, we disturb a lot of uh, powerful stories, uh, societies say. Yeah, like mm -hmm. we are not sexist, we are not racist, mm -hmm. and she's really a very strong thinker. And she, uh, um, she got away from Goldsmith. She resigned. Yes. Yeah. She. Um, uh, so it's a long story, but she also is very vocal against. Uh, the institution of the university uh, globally because the university itself as part of the education system also becomes very institutionalized and rule bound <clears throat> and discriminates against people within the university so she resigned her position mm -hmm. and she's now she calls herself an independent scholar but I agree she's very good to read on uh, all of these sorts of issues. Mm. Yeah. No, mostly racism and uh, racism is a key uh, being uh, from the Muslim community and also talking about uh, different ways how feminism actually can be used uh, uh, in plural to expose uh, these questions.
how do you deal with this also with your students? Because I think also when you talk about diversity, there's this nice diversity, and I was from Egypt, and Egypt is nice for holidays and so on, but when you talk about being Muslim and so on, and lately, I, I, in the beginning it was really nice, and I have to talk about pyramids, and my teacher tell me, okay, when you have fashion, you dress up, and like an Egyptian, it's so nice, you never, never wanted this, but it was the nice thing, like the nice diversity, and bring from home your dishes, because it's so nice, but when I started to wear a headscarf, I had to talk about 9-11, I had to distance myself from 9-11, mm. and I had to talk about, I don't know, all these topics which I have to, and therefore, I'm, I'm really interested how you deal with this when you work with your students, because even though if, they're, if they even have diverse backgrounds, it's not the same, like, mm. yeah, mm. so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you see, uh, class photos are a fascinating thing. <laughs> so we have many, um, contradictory uh, moments, um, analyzing them. And, um, well, what I, um, I try to see that um, diversity discourse is very critical. You know, the story you said now, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny in, <laughs> in a certain way and very interesting. And of course, they, um, um, there are a lot of comments about uh, the politics of identity, yeah, and how this, this is not something um, you can control just by yourself, and how it changes. Like, as you said, so we discussed a lot about, about anti-Muslim racism, yeah, so, um, my point, um, I don't know if it helps, is um, when I'm, I'm trying to think about migration research in a critical way, I find it also very inspiring by uh, Manuela Boyachiev. Yeah? Um, she says, uh, um, I think with Regina Remhild, they say, we're not our... Um, what we want is not to do migrantology, yeah, migrantology, so to study diversity of the person, to study the migrants. We need um, other uh, contexts about our research. And so what I try to find is with intersectionality to say we have to see this how it works all together. So because um, in the private schools, you know, they have a lot of languages, they have a lot of religions, and these schools have no problems. Only the public school says it has problems with languages, with religions, and so on. So I'm not sure if I can answer your, so, it's, um, my point is just to stop this iconography of diversity as excuse for everything works already. That it's not a racist society, it's not an anti-Muslim society, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, ideas that come from theoretical comments, like don't study migrants. Yeah, this is not the point of critical migration research. Study the privileged. Study the nice white parents because they are a social force. They uh, shape the schools very strong. Yeah, look what they do, what we do uh, in many cases. Yeah, and how can we change? Sorry, Claudia. Yeah. No, 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 thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we, it's, uh, please. May I bring you the microphone so that the live stream can hear it or do you not want to? It's okay. Okay. Community. Community in Vienna. 
Yes. So I would say like this community is actually very, very integrated into the society. Uh, you know, nothing to do with the Jews before the war and the Jews that came out after the war and what de you know developed whatever you know from East uh, Europe and Soviet Union whatever, you know. So the Muslim for me actually this is the main the main uh, by, by the way, the Israeli is Jew, actually. For me, the Muslims are, uh, the, and the Arabs, they are the ones, they are the really the outsiders. I mean, the Jews today in Austria, they are completely, completely integrated into the society. The queer, it's actually uh, can give a good, uh, good um, outsider and uh, exclusive position, like to integrate or to take their position very, very inspired and can give a lot of uh, understanding what is inclusivity, what is exclusivity. Uh, the other point that I would like to say, like you, you, you can speak about the outsider, and, but actually you can speak about the, the, the light culture, culture the, the one that mm -hmm. actually yeah. defines those Austrian or those uh, kind of, uh, you know, the main culture that defined it. And actually, this is very interesting for me to understand how you define it, or how do you see it. And the other, the third point maybe it would, would be how to solve it. I mean, if you speak about this, this perspective, like in this uh, book, as I understand, that you are more about how is it uh, formed, or what is the state of, of, of affair of this exclusivity, which is the problem of Every nation state, every now we are suffering very, mm -hmm. very extreme. Not every, not here, everywhere. But in this neoliberalism, yeah. you know, where we live in this populism, this political state, which Austria is also now, and not only here, but also here. And uh, so, how to solve this? It's also, and this will involve also the students to ask how uh, they going, how they can imagine to overcome this. Yeah, but if I can answer uh, to this, uh, I think uh, uh, slightly different, uh, and this is when we uh, put these uh, communities as part uh, of our talk, it was always connected with uh, these processes of marginalization. So in this way, I could uh, uh, think, and I think differently as you, it's not true that uh, uh, you, maybe uh, your perception is that the Jewish community is very integrated, but uh, researches and also realities of life uh, uh, in just colloquial talk uh, shows that anti-Semitism is very strong in uh, Austria. And it's uh, uh, strong, so the, our interest, uh, it's really present, it's present uh, in an in informal way very much, uh, even uh, it's difficult to materialize, it's present uh, uh, as all the other uh, forms of racism, but anti-Semitism first is historically present here, and also today, uh, though it's this, I think, fantasy that is gone, and it's not uh, put in many preambulas uh, in, uh, in order to be very um, clearly stated that it is uh, necessary to oppose anti-Semitism, uh, still um, uh, exist really in many informal ways and uh, have uh, impacts uh, uh, that are even not formalized. So our interest was, when we talk about these three communities, was to uh, identify also uh, these processes of marginalization. So. Maybe you are uh, 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 integrated, if we go back to the Jewish community, but the anti-Semitism, uh, it's present and is there. So uh, to pose this and to actually bring this topic in this case, because you, you distanciate uh, from the other two communities, 
uh, uh, it's uh, very important to, to actually say, to pause this uh, uh, process, to name this was uh, quite uh, uh, an important uh, point. And this is what was done by um, uh, 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 the person that we asked from the Wiesenthal uh, Institute uh, to come and to talk through art, an artistic position uh, that even was not only a Jewish position but was queer and it was uh, uh, actually a migrant. And in the two other co cases uh, with the queer community, actually uh, paradoxical again, though it seems that queer is uh, a lingua franca in neoliberal global capitalism, this is not the case. Uh, uh, the, today, uh, homophobic uh, reactions against queer, trans people, is so back, is so present that is actually uh, almost uh, unbelievable that we actually see something that was seems uh, at least what is said for the civilized Occident. Uh, that is something that you can pass without a question. And regarding migrants. This is absolutely the most clear um, uh, place for uh, all forms of racism. And it's true, anti-Muslim racism is key uh, for uh, migration because uh, the, in neoliberal global capitalism, the division, like before, was between East and West. It was this Europe uh, there, and nobody knew. And then it was the Western Europe. Today, it's actually the line uh, of uh, this racial uh, colonial division that practically we don't talk anymore even about migrants, or if we talk, we talk how to get rid of them. And all of those who are born uh, uh, in uh, the Europe, uh, it's actually, uh, although they are citizens in a full mean of this world, if they are recognized uh, uh, that they are different, no? And some, uh, thank you very much for your comment uh, uh, that was done from the public all about this diversity. More or less, uh, uh, they face uh, actually very uh, strong processes of marginalization. And I know this because when you talk in the Academy of Fine Arts, for example, that is an art school, uh, uh, those who are fully citizen of Austria, uh, uh, and they are seen as different, they actually really are marginalized and they suffer for the, from this. But this marginalization, uh, it's uh, having different maybe features uh, as if you are in the situation where you are really a migrant, where you don't have papers, where you have to fight and get them. So uh, just uh, as an answer, and uh, if we could maybe connect because I think it's a really great um, the debate and I would like to uh, present uh, uh, Claudia uh, Tatz Reiter that uh, it's uh, uh, with us, uh, coming from uh, Sweden, professor at the Institute for Research on Ethnicity, Migration and Society, Remeso, at Lynch Lynch Shopping. Shopping, Shopping University in Lynch Shopping, Sweden. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I just say, maybe one element of your uh, uh, research, uh, because your research is in the field of sociology, social theory, race, ethnicity, migration, and gender. And you really use a lot of methods, uh, different methods, uh, uh, in order actually to uh, see also these differences, what migration is, gender, civil society. Um, maybe it will be really um, on the spot to ask, uh, coming from Sweden, and it was always this idea that, uh, uh, at least in the past, Sweden as a welfare state, uh, a very open, uh, and also as a society where it was a lot of migrational processes, now we see a really a drastic change. This is palpable on every level. So my, my question will be uh, uh, such kind of research no? or such kind of uh, project like this citizen science, how you see um, uh, can uh, work in Sweden and also how you see Sweden because you came from Australia. Yes. That yes. Uh, this is also a very important and interesting point. And yeah. you are only two years in Sweden. Yeah, in Sweden. 
In Thanks. Australia, we know, it yeah. has one of the most ferocious politics against uh, those who are seen as refugees or migrants and so on. Um, so thanks, Marina, and um, thanks to Marina and Sophie for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and um, with you all and also for those who are on the live stream. So, so yes, um, I will say a few words uh, about Sweden and um, contemporary Sweden in the context of the discussion here. So um, how has Sweden changed in relation to migration um, and why? Uh, and then I might just say a few words. So I've been in Sweden for two years. Originally, I'm from Australia, and um, but I was born in Austria. So I have um, I have an interest in Austrian society, and I think the discussion here um, is very important and very interesting. But um, uh, I can also see and observe um, similarities between Sweden and Austria. Things that are happening across the European Union. Um, and perhaps I might make a few observations uh, from um, what are called classic countries of immigration. So Australia is one of those that historically is seen as a classic country of immigration. In other words, immigration is the way that the, the nation of Australia built itself. Um, and I think there are some interesting things to say there. So Sweden... Um, you're right, Marina. Sweden is seen, I think, still as um, a very open society where the welfare state is strong in that sense of including and putting the arms around members. I'll say members of a society rather than use the word citizenship because um, I think citizenship has also become a loaded category and term. I'll say a few more things about that in a moment. And I also had that uh, view of Sweden um, before I moved there. Um, but Sweden has changed quite quickly. Um, and uh, so we can observe that um, you know, through legislation and also through lots and lots of scholarship that's happening within Sweden. We can observe that after 2015 which is also sort of a European moment because of what was called the crisis of migration. And I agree with some of the comments that have been made that from my perspective in the research I do, even though I describe myself as working in the field of migration studies, I um, very much stress in my own work, but many other scholars that I align with, that migration is not the problem. And migration is something that both historically and in contemporary times is continuous across society. So migration has always occurred and migration still occurs and that it's part of society and it's part of social change. And I think seeing the phenomena of people crossing international borders in that way changes everything yeah. because it normalises who is amongst us and how we are. It normalises... Um, the very question of diversity and how we frame something like diversity. You know, diversity is not what we observe above and observe visually as a phenomena, but it's, it's how we are with each other, what lies underneath. But Sweden, so Sweden um, changed radically after 2015. Um, from 2016, um, new laws were passed and it is now extremely difficult for newcomers, um, people like me as well, who come to Sweden uh, but who are not Swedish. And, um, and so one of the things I observe there, uh, and it fits very well into this discussion here, is that, S that Sweden and Swedish society is facing this dilemma because just as Austria and just as many countries, Sweden is constituted by many, many people, very active people in society, who are, um, who may be Swedish born, but who are originally from other countries, let's say, from uh, have other citizenships and other nationalities. And the question that Sweden is facing is, what is it to be Swedish? How long do you have to have lived in a country like Sweden to become Swedish? Uh, and I can give you an example of that. There is a, um, an office, a federal office of the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner 
in Sweden. And I went to some of their talks recently when they published the new annual report of what it means, what anti-discrimination means in Sweden. And for me, coming from a country like Australia, where discrimination is actually understood very differently, I'll talk about that in a moment, what I observed is that the um, anti-discrimination commission and commissioner who ought to see discrimination from my perspective in certain sorts of ways, counts um, Swedes, people who are born in Sweden, but whose parents were not born in Sweden, counts them in a different way in the census than real Swedes, let's say. And I found that quite shocking and startling, that it counts and it has a different name for a, a young Swedish person born in Sweden, but whose parents, so it's second generation, but can also be third generation, they are counted as Swedish with an immigrant background. And Sweden is facing all sorts of issues, as many other societies are, with young people in many, many different small towns and also big cities like Stockholm, who feel excluded in various ways. So they were born there, they speak Swedish fluently, uh, but they're treated differently. Uh, so I think for me, that example of what the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner does, this official agency, um, uh, and so then what I've also observed um, as a point of differentiation is a society such as Australia has many, many problems, and as Marina, as you've observed, in terms of um, the, the politics of refugee arrivals, Australia has a very harsh history. But when it comes to an immigrant society and when it comes to something like citizenship, uh, and I see citizenship in two ways. There's the formal part of citizenship. Do you have a passport? Do you have a visa? Do you, you, know, do you um, have the documentation that shows that you are Swedish or Australian or Austrian? And that's, of course, important because it allows us to do certain things within a society and it allows mm -hmm. us to cross borders. But for me, the equally important and sometimes more important of, uh, aspect of citizenship is belonging. So it's the, the unofficial, and I think that's what you're studying, and that's what as many, uh, was so interesting in terms of schools. Uh, it's the ways in which we signal to each other uh, that we recognise each other as fellow humans that belong. Or, and you, know, you know, all know this very well, or give these um, non-verbal cues often that I, you, I don't really recognise you as being part of whatever this community of belonging is. Um, and so in Australia, uh, and I'm comparing here to Sweden, what I've observed is that as a country of immigration, where uh, Australia is represented by um, people who come from really every nation state on earth, um, yes, there are problems. Yes, there is racism. Yes, there is discrimination. But there is also a, um, a, a general understanding in society that we all come from somewhere else. So I wasn't born in Australia, but I've lived there most of my life. And no one ever questions, you know, are you a real Aussie? What does that, what does that even mean? So um, there is a different sense of belonging, and that's what I've been quite um, startled by in the Swedish case, uh, that it takes so very, very long, uh, and I wonder if ever some people could really become whatever it is, and I still don't really understand this elusive Swedishness, if I can give you one other example that for me is very striking, so in the Australian context, I, my work is with refugee communities, but also with First Nations communities, so Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, who've also faced historical discrimination and exclusion in Australia since white colonisation by the British. Uh, and of course, Sweden has a First Nations group, the Sami people. And uh, what I observe there is also really, I think, quite startling. So yes, in Australia there is active discrimination, but Australians know about First Nations people. They know that there are 500 language groups. 
They know there is great diversity. Um, most Australians don't speak a First Nations language, but it's starting to be taught in schools and so on. So even if people um, have negative attitudes towards Aboriginal people, they know about them. In Sweden, there is no discussion about the Sami people and the role of the Sami people in Swedish society. Uh, I've been quite shocked that even my academic colleagues really don't talk or discuss or see Sami. Um, and so an example I can give is that at the moment, the Swedish government um, commissioned about two years ago, there is now a truth commission in Sweden being undertaken with Sami, um, a bit like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, to see what the situation is in the, oh, the Sami is and where they feel discriminated against and so on. And when I talk to my Swedish friends um, outside academia, no one knows about this, right? It's, a, it's just in a little field of its own. No one knows that there is a truth commission underta uh, being undertaken, which in 2025 will report. And I mean, there is news about what's going on. So there's a lot of um, uh, mineral extraction in the north of Sweden, and people call it green colonialism because the Sami, whose traditional way of life is reindeer herding, are being moved off the land. Um, so that's another example I would give where I'm finding Sweden not such an open society <laughs> after all. Mm. Okay. Uh, any comment uh, uh, or question? Yeah, please. Uh, do you uh, a mic maybe? Yeah, I think it's good. Yes. Um, I think this is quite interesting because I actually have a girlfriend from the United States. And uh, viewing this like difference, like Australia versus Sweden, feels quite similar to the racism in Austria versus the racism in the United States. Where in the United States, when somebody is racist, they're usually like a proud racist, like, yeah, no, I, I'm a racist and I don't want this and that or anything. And in Austria, it's more like, oh, I am not a racist. And it's almost like an insult when you're like mm -hmm. calling someone out for racism. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're not reflecting the ways of racism and still saying like, but I'm not a racist, but Ausländer raus. Yeah. So I think that is quite interesting. Mm. And I had, I had no idea, I must quite frankly say. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, I'll just pick up what you were saying um, uh, with a very quick example, uh, because I agree. I think there are these differences and I think it's almost more, more harmful to an individual when forms of discrimination or racism um, or Islamophobia or homophobia are invisible or hidden in that way that you describe, right? Um, and so, and again, I'll just make a, a, a quick observation uh, in Sweden. I teach an international master program in Linköping. It's a large teaching and research university. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an international program on migration and ethnicity. So we teach, you know, this stuff about borders and what happens to people at borders. And because of the nature of the program, we get a lot of international students as applicants. Uh, and what I've learnt, um, and I've learned to be very polite in asking questions. Um, I think usually Australians are very direct. So I'm found to be very direct. Uh, I ask a lot of questions because what I find is that the international incoming students have a lot of barriers. So they're, they're, they are admitted to the university, they pay their fees, which international fees are now quite high uh, for students coming to Sweden, but they receive no support in getting their visas. And I'm quite shocked by that because I'm used to a university system in Australia where the university surrounds the international incoming students. They want the students to come. Um, and those universities then work with the migration authorities to facilitate the student being able to enter Australia. In Sweden, when I say to my colleagues in the in international mm. office, but I, have, but I have all these wonderful students and they're coming from you know, Bangladesh and Ghana and Pakistan and, and the US and other countries, won't you help them? 
The answer is, in Sweden, we have an equal treatment policy. And if, I, if we were to help your students, that would be discrimination. And, I, and I, it does my head in because I said, no, 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 no. That's not what anti-discrimination means. You are discriminating against the students that I want to come into my classroom from Nigeria and Ghana by not helping them. And they do not understand. There is an absolute wall between their understanding of equal treatment and my advocacy for my students. So that's absolutely in line with what you're saying. And so, yes, we have a global system, but different nation states still matter because I think they understand these issues and talk about them, what diversity means uh, and so on, what amnesia means. They, they understand it very differently. And so we need to keep studying individual societies and cultures because, yes, there's globalisation, but it's still very, it's the national still matters um, very much. Mm. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted uh, maybe to open now the debate, uh, uh, also time-wise, but also because it's uh, really interesting. But I wanted to say that this comment was very good. Uh, uh, Claudia, thank you for this uh, comment on the, the question that actually, because the same is in Austria. No? In Austria, when you uh, practically now in the 21st century, you can, it's a possibility uh, uh, that you have an entry exams by Zoom. That means you can actually uh, give an opportunity to many students who are coming from other parts of the world. They are not rich but they actually can try to enter without uh, uh, going mad because who can come, I don't know, from uh, far uh, Asia uh, to make the entry exam, uh, to spend the days here and then to just realize that you are not accepted. You, you, this uh, is impossible only if you are having actually money for this. And when uh, this Zoom uh, policy started, I thought this is fantastic because it's really a possibility of uh, democratization under uh, the spell of uh, technology that uh, also those who never thought to study in Europe can come, for example, for, from Nepal. And uh, uh, I thought it's fantastic and we really have to keep that came out from the pandemic. When I put these things to my academy, they told me the same thing. They said, no, this is a discrimination mm -hmm. toward those who are from here. Yeah. All of them equally has to come and make the, uh, uh, the entry exams in the space. So it's completely uh, obverse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I was speechless. Yeah. And now, I, and I thought this is only here. I, I said, but what kind of criteria? How you define mm. uh, the, the equality? Yeah. Where you come from Nepal or you are living in Graz, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's gr great that you have both students, but of course, mm. to come and to make the entry exams is just another possibility, you know? So I just wanted to say it's not only in Sweden, but it's uh, mm. really, and uh, more, more uh, the whole idea of uh, the book uh, and all this discussion, it's really about the institutions of education. This is why, where we were also very much triggered when uh, this proposal for citizen science uh, uh, came. Uh, it was not the idea, okay, now uh, we will really uh, think uh, how to uh, provide uh, the better understanding of science. No, we were not interested in this. We were interested precisely uh, the possibility to uh, some of these questions from other research that we were doing, we can actually pose on early stage. As I said, there it's the moment to intervene. In uh, universities, it's good, we can reflect, but we cannot, uh, uh, at least I didn't see such initiatives, change what's going on and uh, what, Asimina, you wonderfully explain uh, all this uh, differentiation that are uh, fully, in fully going on now. They are pre present, they mm -hmm. are not just a hypothesis what will happen when, mm -hmm. I don't know, privatization and all other side. So, uh, d just to connect, so maybe if it's any other question or comments, uh, it's, yeah, please. 
Yeah, I, I must differ from you. I think that there is another uh, phenomenon. It's another phenomenon: exclusion from the state. Uh, and from the whole system, when it's, uh, we speak about uh, what we spoke about, uh, the Jews' integration or no integration, or uh, exclusion by some elements in the society which has kind of resonance anti-Semitism, and it still exists for sure. There is some uh, position that's uh, 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 raised anti-Semitism, anti-Jews, whatever, but for the state, the system, the whole apparatus is completely uh, uh, integrate with the uh, with, with Jewish, you know, Jewish, Jewish Christian. It's very fundamental into the culture of European today, Germany and Austria for sure. Uh, concerning like a civil, uh, like the difference between Sweden to uh, Australia or New Zealand or Canada. I mean, this is like Europe, and this is colonial state, which is by definition, Israel actually, it's also colonial, uh, settled colonialism, but this is another phenomenon because this is Zionism. So you have to be Jews. If you are not Jews, you are excluded. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, by definition racist. This is by definition problematic and exclusion. Uh, but with the immigration, with two, uh, 2015, which I understand 2016 in Sweden, and all Europe is suffer like this kind of a wave of immigration and Europe not able to deal with it actually. Germany did something, Austria suffer, all Europe is suffer, Sweden probably also suffer from this immigration and they do not know how to integrate them. And Muslims actually, they are the ones that suffer. They are the, the exclusion, they are the really the ultimative outsider defined but here and there, they are not FPA, FPA. It's much more than the FPA. It's all, all spread, you know, mm. Germany, here, everywhere. Mm. Do you, yeah. Please go. Yeah, uh, yeah but um, I think I think we also need to work on defining. So, what you mean by different countries of Europe suffer from migration, right? So, um, if we talk about the the 2015 phenomena, what we're really describing. Uh, the arrival of, um, you know, a large-scale arrival of refugee populations, right? Mostly refugee populations. Um, so Germany received mostly Syrians, um, for example, and uh, the other great displacement is Afghanis, Afghanistan. So I think with an issue like that, it's also important to step back and look at the global context. So if we're talking about Europe, the same is true of um, the settler colonial nation states, the immigration communities, Australia, Canada, um, America. But if we just talk about Europe for a moment, I think the question that I would pose to you or that I would pose back by saying let's pan to the global level is what is the vision of society that we have? And for me, that, that vision goes back to who is the human? So Europe understands itself very much as a human rights bearing entity. Uh, well, if we look at the phenomenon of 2015 and the reaction in the subsequent years and what's happening across Europe now, I would say that human rights have been emptied out. Human rights remains nothing more than a rhetorical signifier mm -hmm. because what is happening across Europe is that um, people who are labelled as migrants are being stigmatised as the cause of the problems, the root of which is, in my estimation, neoliberal capital. It has nothing to do with migration movements. Um, and so I think we just need to be clear about the analysis of what's called a problem. Um, uh, I mean, I think the example of the UK and the UK moving to Brexit uh, crystallises that very much. Brexit was all about um, immigra immigration. It was all about an anti-immigrant group of parties saying, let's leave the European Union. And if you look at the UK now, in terms of economy and financially, it's a basket case, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's not that it's pushed out immigrant populations. Immigrants fr that were in the UK have left wholesale, have gone elsewhere, and they don't have people to do the work. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think when we say these things about 
migrant problem, for me it's important to pan back and look at um, other phenomena in society, how the economy is working, how culture is working, and, uh, and look at those all together. Uh, and then from my analysis, it's actually not migrants who are the problem, uh, it's other phenomena. And, um, and in terms of the refugee issue, I think what we can also see there is that refugee populations we know are growing. At the moment, they're growing again because of uh, the war in Gaza, also the war in Ukraine. Um, but refugee populations across the world are mostly housed in poorer countries. So Europe and Australia and US and Canada do not house most of the world's refugee populations. They're mostly housed in camps in Africa, across Asia. Countries like Australia put them in detention centres and throw away the key. So I, I think, yeah, I, I, would frame, I would frame your framing differently from my perspective. Uh, I'm thinking maybe coming a bit back to the classroom as you were speaking about the different uh, marginalization processes that you were uh, working with. I was thinking of a, of a queer kid somehow like being in the classroom and listening to these uh, processes and maybe feeling othered by discussing such topics. And so I wanted to ask like, uh, how do you provide a maybe like a safe space for like the community cohesion in the classroom while somebody is kind of kind of objectified through dealing with such a topic and yeah so how did you work with that and how how do you think people should work with that <coughs> Food, this is um, yeah this is a very difficult question you are posing and um, Well, we have actually a discussion with parents who are choosing an um, alternative school context because uh, they um, want to support uh, very strong the, uh, a, um, a, a valuable um, umgang. I have to think about the English word. A uh, way of dealing with... Thank you. Yeah. Um, with queerness in the classroom. And so they rejected uh, Muslim parents with their child. So it's a quite wide community then, this alternative school. Um, and they rejected Muslim parents because they said these parents don't support these values we have. Um, it's, it's not easy for me to give all these questions. I don't think this is the right way. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm opposing this selection process they choose because they, they already have a quite safe place. And uh, we have to learn to talk about these things. You know, this is not something uh, we just can. We cannot just be anti-racist. We cannot be just queer friendly only because we wish to mm. be like this. And um, children who are growing up in such kind of, uh, you know, protective up place where they exclude any other um, way to deal with it, um, I'm, I'm getting a bit, a bit nervous about it, you know. On the other hand, um, it's very hard to, to have safe spaces in schools. It's, uh, it demands a lot of engagement and involvement. Um, requires a lot of discussions with parents and uh, um, teachers and uh, school directors. I have to say that we are in a process to, to find ways 
to deal with these questions. Though this actual um, situation, uh, it, um, yeah, it is a difficult, for me it was difficult to, to find a solution for everybody, you know, who, are, who was involved in this situation. But I find alternative schools from this point difficult. I am, am embrace a lot of their ideas, yeah, but the kind of parallel societies there, um, I, I find very difficult to, to deal with everything in this um, situation. And safe spaces, um, when are safe spaces uh, really safe in this direction? Is it just not to get in touch, to not to get in discussions? In because how long can you protect children? Yeah, I, I think everybody has. Uh, we have to learn to deal. We have to learn to oppose, to have oppositional voices. We have to learn to be solidary, to, to, uh, to learn solidarity. At mm -hmm. Maybe there are more ideas yeah. about yeah. it, but it's really a, a point that you touched with your question that um, I, I really have to deal with it uh, in discussions with parents. I also want to ask about, you were saying about the real origins of the problems. Um, so I want to ask about like tools for, for actually going to the source of the problems. For example, when it comes to global warming, what has for me a lot to do also with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, and also about what we are talking right now, I feel like it's still in very small bubbles and these bubbles are very conscious. But when I am moving in different bubbles, the mainstream is still very unconscious and very closed up to all of this. So what are tools to widen, widening up and um, reaching more people, reaching more different social classes or different social bubbles? Um, is there, yeah, is there an answer? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, please, please, I'll, go I'll be go. quick. Uh, it's a really complex layered question, but I will just have a stab at it um, in terms of something that's been mentioned uh, today quite a bit and is the background for the study, and that is amnesia. So the way in which uh, the, what I would call the politics of remembering or forgetting um, is, is used and also misused, and I think to answer your question, it's a really powerful tool that is, whether it's in a school situation with children or it's in a broader social context or it's with cultural institutions or universities, um, it's not to forget history but to work with history. Uh, and um, so there I would say that amnesia works in amnesia and also remembering, right? So the difference between forgetting uh, which we're often asked to forget things, like to get, get over, get over the past in order to build a new society, right? So South Africa did that in some ways with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which said, tell the truth. It asked the perpetrators of heinous acts to tell the truth. And then, and the idea was, and then we can kind of not forget, but then we can kind of get on with society, get on with making a new life. Um, and other societies have dealt with rupture in different sorts of ways. Um, but what I would say to answer your question at the more micro level of our everyday life and everyday practices, and you, you were saying climate change is an example, nation states remember collectively, so they remember what is it to be the nation, right? What is it to be Austrian? You have a national day and you have all, all sorts of other moments where Austrians cohered together and where, you know, um, the gentleman at the back used the word integration, right? So what is it that if someone is new to Austria, what is it that you ask people to do in order to join this national story of what it is to be Austrian? But then there's also 
the other and I think really important aspects, which is the, the social parts, the things that we do together where we either remember or we forget. So Marina was making the point in relation to anti-Semitism that anti-Semitism didn't sort of end at a particular moment, it's ongoing. Um, and so the histories, you know, the histories of what we do with the planet are the histories of um, uh, capital, again, the exploitation of nature or the nurturing of nature. So in schools, we tell stories, right? And in Australia, the stories of indigenous culture are so important for children to be learning and they are taught now because Aboriginal culture, see, they see themselves as the custodians of nature, whereas we have taught our children that nature is there to be exploited, right? We just take, take, take. So there is this difference in terms of the histories of how nature is understood. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a last question because can yeah, I, or yeah. But they, they, yeah, please. I would say, let's look at our networks. Yeah. How different are the people? Why they are so homogeneous? Yeah, it's very. Um, it's, it's very tiring to be friend with people who are not the same class, the same uh, ideology and so mm. on. Yeah? But um, I think we have to, to leave the bubble. It's a lot of work. Mm. And most of us, they have to work a lot in capitalist system. So we don't, we don't have enough time for relationships. And the school should be such a place where children can get friends without all this pressure. And if we stop them from there, um, despite the problems, yeah, they're going to be here. But if we ask us about our networks, yeah, how many different social groups are there? Mm. Um, yeah, this would be my uh, my um, my way to think about it, to yeah. try to make yeah. them not for a, a photo, then to take a photo and say, look how diverse my networks are, but really to make the work. It is work. Mm. It's not uh, a resource. It's not uh, uh, great. It's really work to be together with people who let's say, don't earn so much money as you, or th they don't have so much free time as mm -hmm. me, or however, yeah, how we compare it. But I think this is, um, this is the way actually we all of us want to be at the end. If, if we think about it, yeah, nobody mm -hmm. once wants to be racist. I was, I never thought of it, of this white supremacy, and that people are um, proud of themselves. No, I, don't, I just mm. don't know mm. this in my context. In my context, nobody wants to be uh, a racist. Mm. Yeah? And there is then, the problem is, um, we, we talk a lot about self-reflection. I did it already now, about looking at our networks, yeah? how they are, how homogeneous they are. Um, but actually, we have to change the structures. Yeah, only self-reflection because the problem in Austria or in Western Europe maybe mm. is that people, especially in the universities where, where the most networks for my networks are, they learn to perform anti-racist. Mm. They learn to say the right words. So um, uh, I don't um, the also... I, I find it um, difficult for me to not to oppose to the way you framed your question. And people most of the time learn to say the right words, to say the right things, but they don't change mm -hmm. anything on the structures. And self-reflection becomes for well-educated uh, people to a kind of performance. Yeah, and this is not enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry yeah. for no, it's, it's taking super. so much time. No, it's Thank important. So much. Yeah. Um, my question was uh, partially already answered by this beautiful um, monologue, I wanted to say. But um, my question would be if any safe space can truly be safe 
if it has to exist as such. If it has to exist as if such. It, if it has to exist as such. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Azimina, I think you will answer this much better than me, but I'll just quickly say, I think that what you've posed is the nub of the problem, uh, which is that we are all working mm. towards something, uh, and but reaching it may be, may be elusive, but working towards. So what you were saying, as, um, as Amina, in your comments, I think is so important. This um, critical self-reflection, but one that is genuine rather than performative, because mm. yeah. Um, performativity is also a privilege. I think that's up that many of us, have, some of us have. So yeah, I would just say that's the nub of the problem, that we are working towards because in an ideal situation, you wouldn't have to create a safe space, which is what you are so beautifully saying. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a kind, so kind of, if I try to think of it together, mm. yeah. It's kind of safe space is a, is a, a sign of privilege, mm. also. Mm. So uh, a professor from from the USA, she's working with uh, action research. So she wants her students to go to the communities and make research. And she said a lot of students say no because mm. they need safe spaces or they are going to be hurted. It's too hard mm. to be there. Mm. And she says they don't make any experiences. You know, the need to be, our need, so let's speak about we, our need to be, to do the right thing, to be mm. nice, to be uh, anti-racist, to be, to do the right things. It's so strong that we stop doing experiences. Yeah, so this also, uh, the discussion with her was very so, like, uh, because in the USA it's a big discussion about it. Mm. And yeah, we can't meet the other experiences outside the bubbles. But I also think uh, we need actually a safe space. Mm. Why? Because uh, if uh, uh, you, you need an, a certain moment to have a bubble in order to also <laughs> have a possibility to reflect. Mm -hmm. Because how you will go mm -hmm. uh, to get experiences if you didn't uh, have uh, a possibility even to come to a space where you could open a certain debate. So I, I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, one and the other, uh, and uh, I valued very much uh, uh, safe spaces because I understood uh, that uh, when you are uh, fully uh, pushed apart or discriminated or you actually are uh, feeling a huge violence uh, in uh, uh, in settings that are palpable you actually need a space where you can open uh, a debate i learned very much this uh, um, in uh, again in this process in the academy when uh, it was a debate uh, uh, with uh, uh, a black uh, a community uh, that uh, practically said, no, we need a safe space because we need a space where we can talk and a space that uh, actually we extract out and in which we can uh, first understand what's going on and also prepare ourselves for the violence that is coming out. So in this way, I actually, uh, I also was very skeptical, but then I understood that uh, it's an important process. You have to empower yourself uh, also with getting the conscience. So I think it's a, it's a good point. Because the system is so violent. Neoliberal capitalism, the world that we live in is extremely violent. Uh, toxic, violent, brutal, murderous, and so, uh, but we should do these things earlier. So this was the idea, no? Mm -hmm. Not wait where we are now, but much, much more earlier, mm. Mm -hmm. also to, to give this uh, possibility to talk, to think. No? Which we can continue to do, if I may say <laughs> yes. so, outside yeah. where yeah. there is a little bit of food waiting for us yeah. and some drink uh, to which you're all invited. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming, for staying with us for so long. Maybe there's some people online still. And thank you to the podium for you, Claudia, Simina, for joining us here. and. Um, 
yeah, uh, we've left some QR codes in case people want to order the book. You can find it online. And yeah. Or we you can just contact us. And that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.